growing population means growing more food. But can farmers get more bountiful harvests from the land without threatening the environment or taking away land from other needs? Our two guests today argue that biotechnology, genetically engineered crops, is key to the future of food. Pam Ronald is a professor of plant pathology and leads the plant genome program at UC Davis. Much of her work has focused on rice, the staple diet of half the world's population, more than three billion people. She has worked with the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines and with rice growers both in the U.S. and in developing countries. In 1996, she established the Genetic Resources Recognition Fund, a UC Davis program to share benefits of biotechnology with developing countries. In a forthcoming book, Ronald and her husband, who manages the student organic farm on campus, argue that the future of food is a marriage of organic farming and genetic engineering. Eduardo Blumwall holds the Will W. Lester Chair in Pomology in the Department of Plant Sciences at UC Davis. Blumwall's laboratory studies a wide range of plants, including rice, wheat, cotton, and citrus fruit, as well as model plants such as tobacco and tomatoes. His special interest is in developing salt-tolerant and drought-tolerant plants that can grow in soils affected by salinity. Thank you both for coming on Frontiers. Thank you. Pam, could you tell us what really genetic engineering is? Genetic engineering is a form of crop modification, but it differs from standard breeding techniques that we've been using for many years. Genetic engineering has been around for about 30 years, and the, the major difference is that with genetic engineering, you can introduce a gene into a plant from any species. So it, in, it introduces this idea that you have a vast potential for genetic alteration of a plant. Now, Professor Blumwald, how does this differ from what they did 10,000 years ago with traditional plant breeding? Essentially, it's not very different. Uh, 10,000 years ago, when you cross two plants, you are going to put part of a chromosome that contain genes, many genes, from one plant to the other. What you do with genetic engineering, essentially you are tailoring a particular gene. You use methodology to just isolate that particular gene. But essentially you are transferring genes. So besides the how to you do it, it's exactly the same. So what are the potential uses of genetic engineering in food crops, Pam? Well, one, there's a couple traits out there, and one of the most important, I think, is for uh, reducing the use of pesticides. So there's a pest-resistant crop that's available. And in the future, the, the, there is hope that we'll be able to engineer plants to withstand uh, diverse environmental stresses. Are there other potential uses? No, essentially those are very important. Uh, one of the things that we have to uh, recognize is that we are incrementing our production. The Green Revolution has brought massive amounts of production from the 60s up, and we are now reaching a plateau because something has to give. We are obviously extensively using our natural resources, and as a consequence of that, we are facing deterioration of our soils. We are imposing, if you want, with larger production, extreme conditions for growth. Now, would organic farmers agree with that? Well, uh, yeah, I assume that, yes. The only problem when you talk about organic farmers, you are talking about scales. Organic farming is a relatively small scale of farming and pleases, if you want, a particular sector of the population, population that can afford organic grown products. When you go to the large part of this world that, does, that cannot afford that, cannot afford those prices, well, you are thinking in a total different scale. So, yes and no. So, so Pam, do you think that uh, there definitely is a need for genetic engineering? Yes, I do. I think we need to combine genetic engineering with the concepts that organic farmers have really brought to the forefront. And what's interesting is organic farming started um, moving forward quite rapidly in the United States about 30 years ago, the same time that genetic engineering was discovered. So I, I see these as two parallel processes that are bound to intersect. And the reason is organic farmers have really been careful to think about reducing the amounts of pesticides and fertilizers in the environment. Be, as we know, uh, some pesticides can be toxic to farm workers and runoff of fertilizers uh, creates environmental problems. We also need to be sensitive to the local communities 
and to the poor and malnourished. So I think if we take the modern genetic techniques of genetic engineering and combine those with the sort of production agriculture that we can end up with a much better uh, food supply that will benefit more people. But don't you think organic farmers are the biggest skeptics of genetic engineering? No, I don't think so actually. In the Davis community, uh, there's quite uh, a mixture of geneticists and organic farmers. And the farmers are the ones that really know what the environmental problems are. They're aware of soil erosion. They're very aware of overuse of pesticides and fertilizers. And uh, virtually all organic farmers I've talked to are very interested in genetic engineering. Eduardo, do you agree that they can coexist peacefully? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think that coexistence is not the problem. The problem is how we can solve uh, the problems at a different scale. I think that, in, as I said, in a relatively small scale when you compare to the world, I think organic farming is a great, is a great deal. The only problem is that when you go now to places like Africa and Asia and uh, South America, some places in the States with the, where the erosion of the natural resources are so huge and the limitations, uh, lack of water, bad soil, increase salinity in the soil, uh, you have to attempt new methodology and try to generate plants that are able to grow on that. And I think in those environments, uh, organic farming as it is right now uh, is going to be limited. So you're talking about economic constraints. Are there political strengths to genetic engineering? Political constraints? There are, there are a lot of political yeah. constraints. And how is the scientific community handling those constraints? Well, the problem is it's market-driven. So there's been two large, well, many reviews, but the United Kingdom carried out a five-year scientific review of genetic engineering. They had a moratorium on planting of genetically engineered crops for five years. And at the end of that, they concluded that genetic engineering poses no new risks that we don't have with traditional breeding. Although each uh, new genetically engineered plant has to be looked at it on a case-by-case -case yeah. basis. The National Academy of Science has concluded the exact same thing, that the process is not inherently more risky than traditional breeding. But it depends what trait you put into the plant, so everything has to be looked at separately. I think the problem is now are really, it's really market driven because there are a lot of uh, consumers that are fearful of genetically engineered food. They have the perception that it could hurt you and of course there has been no environmental or health issue associated with genetically engineered foods. So the public doesn't really know that and because of that countries are reluctant to grow and export genetically engineered food because of their markets. The European Union is an example of that. So, Eduardo, what are the safety and environmental concerns that you have? Uh, none whatsoever. In fact, today in the UK, they have a, one transgenic uh, sugar beet that has been given the get go, and there are another 17 different cultivars under a uh, uh, under uh, examination, growth, etc., etc., in Europe. Uh, I have no, no problem, actually. It sounds like genetic engineering may have a PR problem. Is that true? That is true. I, it's more than that. There is, there is a political uh, issue behind that we should not avoid. And the problem is uh, the politics of the world has changed in the last 10 or 12 years. And then we have a, a lot of youngsters that need really um, reasons, Le raison d'etre, why we are and against what. Multinationals are not very friendly. They are, they are giving a bad, and they have no PR policy trying to explain the people why it's no problem with transgenic crops. And then there has been this, um, politically driven um, bad PR. You agree with that, don't you? I think, no, I think it's a little more complex than that. I, I think the corp multinational corporations are trying to have a large publicity campaign, but 
most of the public doesn't trust the multinational uh, corporations, so I think uh, it really needs to be science-based. I think we need to look very carefully at the science, and it is a relatively new technology. It's only 30 years old. Um, it depends what gene is put into the plant. Theoretically, a gene could be put into a plant that um, can make it uh, move into the wild population, although that's never occurred in the past with any domesticated species. The domesticated species usually stay in the farms because they're sort of crippled. They need a lot of fertilizer, they need a lot of water, so they generally don't move out into the population. But we need to be very careful and we need to look at that very carefully. And we do. There is there's a nothing more check and double check than the transgenic crop. You have in the United States you have the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, that looks at the particular properties of the products. And then you have uh, other agencies, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Food and Drug Administration, that are going to uh, run extensive, extensive uh, uh, tests for five, six, seven years in order to give you the green light and exhaust every single possibility that the composition of that crop is good for you, or at least it's not bad for you, that that plant is not going to start growing wildly everywhere. Let me, let me just ask Pam about rice. Uh, that's such a major crop for the world. Now what are you doing in your lab to make this work universally? We're interested in improving rice tolerance to stress. The reason this is important is because many rice plants grow in areas where there are many stresses. Uh, Eduardo can talk about some, and one thing we've been looking at in my lab is tolerance to flooding or submergence. So in South and Southeast Asia, there's 140 million farmers that live in these flood-prone uh, zones. And we know as scientists that there is a gene uh, that allows the plant to withstand flooding. It allows the plant to stay underwater for two weeks. However, using standard breeding approaches, uh, breeders were unable to introduce this gene into rice varieties. So over the last 20 years, my colleagues at the International Rice Research Institute and I, as well as a group from UC Riverside, have tried to understand and isolate this gene. And we have been successful, and we've genetically engineered rice plants that are able to withstand uh, flooding for two weeks. Good. And Eduardo, about, what about you? Well, I'm going to talk from the other side of the <coughs> water. She has too much. Let's talk California, Southern California. And then in 2003, we signed up 20% <laughs> uh, of the water that comes from the Colorado River to the uh, Imperial Valley to San Diego County. They don't have water for people. So we are losing already 20% of the water, and 20% of the land is going to disappear. We are missing water everywhere, and it's becoming, a, with climate change, increased population, increased production, we have no water. So we have to design plants that are able to sustain growth under limiting water conditions. And you've had but some success. Oh, yeah, yeah. We are, we are having incredible success on that. Other thing, increased salinity, and as you know, we, we have shown that we can grow plants in high, in high salinity. Or, for example, fruits. Why not to incre increase the amount of antioxidants in the fruit and make it more healthier for you? I wish we had more time. But oh. this is interesting, and keep up the good work in your labs, all right? Thank thanks you. for joining us on, on Frontiers. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who joined us for today's discussion. You can learn more about this subject by visiting our website at frontiers.ucdavis.edu.